Interview with Barry Garari, take number five. We were talking about uh, Warsaw under the siege, and you were starting to talk about the evacuation. Yes, you asked me who was with us. And of course, my grandfather and my grandmother were at the center. I do not remember where my great-grandmother was at the time. She had lived separately in Atvotsk, in a different place. And I don't remember at what point she came to uh, Poland, but to Russia, uh, rather, uh, at one point she came to Latvia. But I'm reasonably sure that it was on the same train we were on. I just don't remember the details. Uh, in addition to my mother, my father, and myself, there were uh, probably Rabbi Chaim Meir, who was a retired butcher from, po from Riga, who was serving as my grandfather's manservant. And uh, possibly Chaim Lieberman. I know Chaim Lieberman was with us a little bit later in the story. But uh, that's all I can remember. And the evacuation, you said something about uh, after the firebombing, you were evacuated? After the firebombing, or rather in the middle of the firebombing, uh, it turned out to be too much for the uh, defense, for the air defense that the boys in that particular compound had organized. Some of the Hasidim grabbed hold of a droshke. Troshka is a horse-drawn carriage. And they put grandfather, grandmother, and me on one of them. And then they got another one for other members of the family. <coughs> and we were told to go to a clinic, which was in an area which was not so much in the middle of the Jewish area. We went there, we got there. And I remember that particular Rosh Hashanah evening. Normally, on Rosh Hashanah night, grandfather would spend probably three or four hours in, in, in his Ma'ariv prayer. His uh, much prayer, many tears. <coughs> then, uh, This time, it turned out, he was totally exhausted. He had to sit. He couldn't stand up physically. He couldn't stand up for, us, uh, for his prayers. His prayers took half an hour. He was completely self-controlled. His eyes were dry, and he was reassuring everybody around him. Remarkable strength of character from a man who was unable to move for physical reasons. Later that night, <coughs> some Hasidim got together. They found a man who lived in the area on Granichna Street. And his name was, if I remember it correctly, probably Bornstein. Maybe Bernstein, probably Bornstein. And he gave my grandfather his apartment for the next uh, week or two. So we moved there, and we by then had a minion on Rosh Hashanah morning. Uh, after the firebombing of the previous night, that was quite uh, an accomplishment for people to be able to do that. Rosh Hashanah was difficult. The days after that were difficult because of the various bombardments. Then came Yom Kippur. And then Yom Kippur around af uh, Yom Kippur afternoon. By that time, the, na uh, the Nazis had brought their artillery much closer to the city. So they were no longer dependent on aerial bombs. They could actually blast the city from their long-range guns which they did, and they did that most intensively during the Yilid time. 
me leading at the prayer offered in the late afternoon. I remember the fires and the horror, and now we had to get out. Granichna Street was being hit badly. Now, in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, a cousin of mine named Yankov Gurari, who didn't survive the show, uh, and I went around trying to look for a wheelchair. Grandfather had never sat in a wheelchair before. He refused. We found one. We found a used wheelchair. We paid for it well, and we brought it and hid it so Grandfather wouldn't see it. That afternoon, we got him to sit down on it. And it was very helpful in helping us get out of Granichna. Walking across ruins, a burning city, we finally made it to Nalevki 7. Nalevki 7 was again one of those large tenements which had a, uh, which had a big opening in the middle, sort of built like an O, uh, but it was not round corners, but square corners. It was built like a square, I should say. And it had a very, very deep cellar. We finally made it there, and we finally were able to get down. That took some pleading by our friends. Many of them lived in, uh, in Nalefki 7. So the, the Poles who were in charge of that uh, particular shelter would let us in. We managed to make it down that particular shelter. We stayed there until Erev Sukkot. Erev Sukkot in the morning, it was quiet. Somehow we found out that uh, there was uh, some kind of a Waffenstillstand, uh, I forgot the, the name, uh, cessation of hostilities, momentary, uh, or temporary cessation of the hostilities. I'm searching for the right word. <coughs> and we got out, we looked around, it was so good to see the sun, to smell the air. That was our first uh, moment above ground, if you will. There were no sukkahs. No, there was a holiday of sukkah, but there were no sukkahs that year in Warsaw. Normally, Nalav Kisarim would have been flooded with them. But uh, the understanding was that the German army was poised outside of Warsaw, and they, they would shortly come in. I don't remember exactly when they came in. But things started happening. All kinds of things that would make Jews feel miserable. One of the, their favorite uh, activities in those days, at the very beginning, was to catch a Jew with a large beard and cut off half of it. Half of it being from one ear to the middle of the chin. Occasionally, they would take an ear along. Well, they expected those people to become <laughs> laughing stock. They weren't. They were very evil. <laughs> Father got caught in one of those. After uh, Sukkot, we moved to an apartment which was away from Nalevki. The problem was that we had heard that the SS was looking for Schneerson. And it wasn't clear to us whether it was with benign <laughs> intentions, <laughs> but one never uh, took the risk of, assu of uh, assuming that the SS was doing anything benign for Jews. As it turned out, we moved to the apartment of a man by the name of Herschel Gurari. He was uh, a distant cousin of my father's and mine, 
Uh, he lived away from the center of the Jewish area, and he was willing to let us stay with him. Uh, he had three rooms. These were walk-through rooms, no, no uh, corridor, and they had a kitchen. And he, his wife, toyed there, and four grown children. Yankel, Salman, Nossen, and his daughter all lived there with him. And yet he was able to find room for us. In fact, he gave grandfather and grandmother his larger room, which had a large table also. He gave us the second room, and the six of them fitted into one room. Sometimes some of them slept over with, uh, with friends in the building. And that's where we stayed for a number of weeks. Uh, during the day, grandfather would sit at the table, at the head of the table, and would be doing something. Uh, whenever there was a difficult period, grandfather would tend to organize himself and write, do something specific, concrete. In this case, he was writing Maamorim, he was writing Sikhis, and people were copying this, and they were giving it out to his followers. Others sat around the same table. And we, each one of us did whatever one could. I spent some time copying various Mahamadi. My father was very busy in those days. He was trying to get somehow, on the one hand, let our friends in America know what the situation was. On the other hand, make sure that he didn't tip his hand to the SS. Well, I told you already about his experience of having half his beard cut off. That didn't stop him. And uh, finally, one day, the SS burst in. And uh, the, the manner in which they acted made us feel that that was it. We expected to have one bullet per person, preferably in the, in the back of the head. But no, it turned out that they wanted Schneerson and they wanted to give him a visa to get out. And they wanted to give uh, us also visas. And so that was the beginning of the move out of there. Do you know why they gave you the visas? Under pressure from the U.S. Again, the U.S. was still at peace with the Germans. Latvia was a neutral country. Of course, as far as Latvia was concerned, they regarded Latvia as, they regarded us who were citizens of Latvia, they referred to us as Wanzenberger. Wanz is a bedbug. Burger is a, is a citizen. We are citizens of a bedbug, referring to the size, obviously. In addition to the fact, it's always nice to see something about a Jew. Unfortunately, none of our hosts, Heschel or his three sons or his daughter or his wife, survived. They all perished. So, I have a feeling I've forgotten something, but some parts of this. Well, we were talking about when the SS came in and gave you visas yes, to leave. Yes. And I remember also, my father was trying to negotiate another visa, you know, along the way. Uh, except that interesting, and then towards the end, when he had successfully completed the negotiation, he put out his hand to shake hands. The German wouldn't do that. So he's shaking the hand of a Jew. Inappropriate. I forgot one thing that I should mention. During the very worst period, just before uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I think it was, uh, there was an evacuation of foreign citizens from Warsaw. Official evacuation. We had two hours' notice. 
grandfather couldn't survive that kind of an evacuation. It was in trucks, and he was immobile, it wasn't possible. Uh, so mother and the rest of us decided we were staying with him. However, we talked Chaim Lieberman into being evacuated because we felt that that would be one way of communicating with the, uh, with the outsiders, with our friends outside. Chaim Lieberman didn't want to go, but finally bowed to that. He was a Latvian citizen. And so the Lat Latvia got word that way, and so did America, of course, of uh, grandfather's situation. Well, now coming back, we're now in a situation where we have exit visas. We have grandfather who has a large beard. We have father who has a beard, half a beard. We have the rest of the people who look like they're Jews. What's the chance that we can get out of Warsaw with a permit? The answer was that uh, probably not very good. And so, what the problem was getting an escort, an escort who somehow could get us out of there. Excuse me for a moment. And again, Father was the one who managed to the trick of getting that kind of a person. I'm not quite sure now what he was. He apparently had at one time served in some part of the German SS or some part of the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where, but he had served in some kind of uh, official pro activity. He was very interested in money. And uh, he could metamorphize, uh, metamorph he could undergo a metamorphosis at any point. He could speak as if he were from Heidelich, uh, uh, Hochdeutsch. He could speak a different language. He could make himself appear anything that suited the particular moment. And he was willing to ex uh, escort us to Lithuania. Well, this man helped us get onto the train. And I still remember sitting in the compartment, trying to sort of sink into the wall. And German officers passing through the walk, the corridor, and saying, why should Jews sit in a compartment while we German officers are in a, in a... And I remember that guy talking them out of it. I don't know what he said, but he managed to talk them out of it. We got to Berlin. It was after, after uh, uh, the curfew time. We managed to get two taxis to take us to the nearest place we could go to, namely the Jewish Gemeindehaus, which means the Jewish uh, community house. Now that was a picture of a large and prosperous community which had been reduced to nothing. We were there in a the large hall and there were poor people there with difficult, who couldn't eat, who didn't have what to eat, who couldn't stand up because they had, beaten down, they had been beaten down so much. The site was absolutely horrid. Finally, somehow, we got a place in a small motel. Again, money speaks. And our friends in Warsaw had made sure that we had enough of it. Get through. And we managed to stay there over Shabbos. And then we took the train, again with the sky, with the escort. The train took us first to West Prussia, to, is it East, or, no, it's East Prussia, to Königsberg, and then to Kaunas in Lithuania, and then to Riga. And I never remember welcoming a, a border guard to the extent that we welcomed those Lithuanian border guards. <laughs> it's as if we were being let out of the worst jail in the world. Those were not very friendly people. Lithuanians in general had a tendency to hate Jews. They still do. 
but under the circumstances, they were good, they were God sent. Then we finally got to Riga. Now Riga was peaceful, quiet, and you could see a palpable, somehow, cover of fear. Who knows what's going to happen next? You could feel it all the time. Soon after we came to Riga, grandfather stumbled. Grandfather was being led all this time by hand by somebody because he couldn't do it by himself with a cane also, on the other hand. He stumbled and he fell and he broke his arm. So he had to go to the, uh, to the sanitarium to recover. Otherwise, it wasn't so clear that he could make it to the trip. He did. In the meantime, we determined that Riga was no place to stay, and that Riga would not be a place from which we could mount, from which grandfather could mount any kind of uh, organized rescue effort. It was too close. We could almost feel the German fingers, or the, and the Russians on the other side. So the conclusion was that we decided to leave, the we being, in this case, grandfather on information supplied by father and various other senior people. And we decided to go to, uh, to the US. This trip to the US had to take place via Sweden. We had to have an air connection from Riga to Stockholm, train to Göteborg, which was a larger port, and there we would board a ship, the Drottninghall, which would take us to New York. N Sweden was neutral at the time. Riga was neutral at the time. So that was still feasible. I don't know how they got us a space on, uh, on the plane, because the planes were full. There were not that many planes, and they were not that big in those days. And I have to tell you a little hum uh, humorous story. My father had been told that flying was a, still a dangerous thing. So he first made sure he got it, my grandfather's blessing for the flight. And then he had heard that chewing helps so that one's ears don't. So there he was, sitting in a seat, chewing furiously, with big white kerchiefs stuffed in his ears so that the pressure wouldn't affect him too much, and asking everybody around him whether that was sufficient to get him <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is the same man, however, who also managed, was totally fearless when it came to getting, uh, to going into the most dangerous places in order to get us out of Warsaw. But this was a very comical moment, and we should have a few light moments sometimes. We came to uh, Stockholm, and if I remember correctly, I am very bad at names, and I may be making a mistake. There was a Rabbi Zuber there. And he told us about the problems of the Jewish community in Sweden. Sweden was neutral. But Sweden became very much concerned about the rights of animals. So they determined that shchita, killing by ritual uh, killing of uh, birds, of chickens, or of um, animals, was not permissible for, because it was unfair to the animal. Therefore, there was no meat for Orthodox people. But Orthodox people did survive. Other Jews did survive in Sweden during that particular period. I remember Rabbi Zuber later coming to New York. Unfortunately, he was killed by some criminal. I don't remember the particular uh, situation. Anyway, from Sweden, from Stockholm, we took the train to Göteborg, 
We took the Jatling home, which was a Swedish ship, neutral. Remember, that was very important. And we started on the trek. Once on this trek in the Atlantic, we were stopped by German warship. Uh, they looked, and after a while they decided it wasn't worth bothering with, because it was a neutral ship from neutral country. The citizens were ap apparently mostly uh, people from neutral, uh, citizens of a neutral country, so the heck with it, they didn't bother with this. So on March 18th, I remember I was dropping anchor in the harbor of New York, close to the Statue of Liberty. It was a wonderful feeling, and yet, you know, as a young immigrant on that particular ship, I was asking myself, is there any place where a, where a Jew would really be welcome? It wasn't clear. Well, we had a wonderful welcome on the 19th when we pulled in. Grandfather's followers came, many friends. They put us up at uh, the Greystone Hotel, Broadway and 91st Street, and that became our home for quite a while, half a year roughly. And then, for a small period, for a short period during Passover, grandfather had an invitation from one of his more distant admirers to spend the Yontif in Lakewood, which we did, but it turned out to be a limited invitation. So we went back to, uh, to the Greystone Hotel. <coughs> and we had, we appointed a committee, or rather, the Agudas Chabad membership appointed a committee to look for a home for grandfather. Finally, uh, after about most of half a year, we found a home on, at 770 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. It was a beautiful house which was owned by a physician who was doing some things which at the time were illegal. And so he had to say, uh, the court sold it. Grandfather got the middle floor, nice apartment. There was a, there was a shul and a secretariat on the ground floor, and there was also a study for grandfather on the ground floor. And then on the top floor, there was an apartment, which we got, and there was one extra room, which father converted into a, uh, a uh, place for a secretary, for a secret part of the secretariat of the yeshiva. And that's where we spent quite a number of years. I, for one, spent there until after grandfather's death, which came in 1950. My parents lived there much longer than that. You had mentioned that your grandfather parents packed an entire household when you yes. left Otvotsk. Did that make it to the United States with you? Later on, after the war, parts of it did. Parts of it did as, uh, parts of the library made it. But uh, many things did not. We'll continue on the next tape.